Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Awesome. Glad to hear it. If uh, you don't know me and I don't know you or something like that, my name's Tim. I'm the lead minister here at Markle Church of Christ, and I have the honor and privilege uh, to do this on most Sundays, although Nick did it last week and he knocked it out of the park. So, you know, oftentimes uh, that's my favorite thing is uh, I, I really genuinely love seeing other people uh, knock things out of the park. That's fun. So, good job, Nick. But most Sundays I get to do this, and I'm honored to. And so we are in a new series, as, as Nick and Corbin both said, uh, called I Give Thanks. And um, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not a topical sermon series guy. I'm normally a straight-up books of the Bible series person. And I know that we did this series because, well, it's November and it's Thanksgiving. And I will admit, uh, I resonate with what Corbin said. I'm going to skip over Thanksgiving and get to Christmas. We were somewhere yesterday, and I heard a Christmas song for the first time. And I'm like, let's go ahead and put our lights and tree up now. Let's just do it. Let's just get it going, the warmth of the season. But the reality is, is that uh, we do have the Thanksgiving holiday, and, and that, that word, Thanksgiving, is an appropriate one, not just because of the fact that we all have life and we get to live in a, in a free country and, and all the benefits thereafter, but more importantly and superseding all of that is that we serve a glorious God that not only created everything, but made a way to him through his son Jesus. And in reality, I give thanks sounds like a nice sermon series for a Thanksgiving month, but it's kind of a subversive notion because as I think we're going to see throughout and especially this morning uh, truly giving thanks is not easy if we're honest I'll give you a personal anecdote so <clears throat> my counselor Denny Howard uh, once told me a few sessions back I mean this is probably a year ago I was in there, I was having some bad anxiety moments, and I was letting him know what was going on in life, and he goes, you know, I'm going to stop you right there, I want to give you a challenge. I want you to find five things every day that you're thankful for, and I want you to write them down somewhere. And he said, because one of the unfortunate aspects of anxiety is our brain focuses on the negative, on the things that we want to spiral about. And he said, being thankful, having gratitude, and actually notating, and actually having to find things to have gratitude for, pulls your focus away from the negative and onto the things with which we can be grateful for. And they can also cause you to realize that maybe everything isn't falling apart, even though that's what your brain is telling you in the moment. So when he did that, that first night, you know, I, I had, the, had the counseling session. I'm like, all right, I'm going to try to do this every day. I'm going to confess right up front. I have not had perfect attendance to my daily gratitude five. But I try to do it on most days. I have a little journal app on my phone, and I just write a heading, and it says the daily gratitude five, because I have to be really technical and not just make the list. So I've always got to note what it is. And I noticed something when I started doing this. The first few days were easy. Because if you haven't been doing a gratitude journal, like literally finding something to be thankful for, like I, I go out in the car and the sun was shining that day and it was nice and warm, I'll write that down. I had a good breakfast today, I'll write that down. My kid was good in this moment, I'll write that down. I got to watch a funny sitcom. I'll write that down. And the list goes on and on and on. But when you get about five days into this, I don't know if you're like this, but you start to think, well, I can't repeat stuff. That would be cheating. If I wrote down the sitcom thing again, then it gets harder. And then you have to start looking. You have to start thinking deeply. And when things get hard, what do we normally want to do? We want to quit. Because I don't want to feel bad that I can't come up with something to be thankful for. Does that make me an unthankful and ungrateful person? 
I don't want to think that way about myself. So it gets harder. So you have, to, you have to force the issue. You have to find something. Maybe you have to find a moment within an otherwise not great situation that you can see the light trickling in through the darkness. And then when that gets hard, <laughs> then guess what happens when you have a bad day? Anybody ever had a bad day before? You wake up in the morning, your coffee has grinds in it, and from that moment, the day is terrible, and everything that you see and experience the rest of the day feels like it's off. And the next thing you know, you get home from work, and you're grumpy, and nothing can make you happy, and what do you say? You're like, I just had a bad day. It causes you to look at everything through this negative lens. But you get ready to go to sleep at night and you realize, oh, my counselor wants me to do the daily gratitude five. And you just want to write the heading and then write nothing. <laughs> but you have to fight to find it. You have to fight to look. You have to look back through the day with your eyes open to find something to be thankful for. This is why, by the way, anytime I've ever been in a family setting and we do the go around the table and say something you're thankful for, oh, I don't like that. Puts me on the spot. It's kind of like when you're asked to pray in front of people and you're not used to doing that. Anybody ever been asked to pray in front of people and you're not used to it? You can raise your hands. I've been in that situation. And then you, you're like, I hope this prayer sounds really good and spiritual. I don't want to pray the wrong things or look like I'm not got my, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. We get in those situations and we got we to gotta say something good. It's got to be really meaningful. This morning we're going to look at Paul's moment of gratitude in the letter of 1 Corinthians. And I love that we're starting with this particular moment of gratitude with Paul in this particular letter for this particular church. Because if you've ever read 1 Corinthians before, you will know that the church at Corinth was a mess. Everything Paul says in what we're going to read today ends up being almost antithetical to the actual situation to which he's writing. The church is divided. There's promiscuity. There's all sorts of idol worship. There's misappropriation of the spiritual gifts of communion, which we're going to do at the end of service. You read through the entire letter and you can find, counting on more than two hands, the number of things wrong in the church that Paul is supposedly thankful for. And here's the kicker, because I'm going to show it to you. The actual things that Paul says he's thankful for, for this church, are moments where he notes gratitude in the middle of the problems. Which, if you remember what I just said, and you've ever experienced the same thing I was articulating before, it's really hard to find thankfulness when things feel like they're going wrong. Oh, and by the way, as Nick pointed out last week, you guys know there's some sort of thing going on on Tuesday? I heard enough laughter to know what you're, you know what I'm talking about. There's an election on, on Tuesday. Did you get into that? That means that, that some of you are going to be very happy at some point after the results, and some of you are not. Go ahead if you end up not being happy and go and do a five gratitude notes thing. That I, see, if, see if you can do it. It'll be fun. There will always be something wrong. Or at least it'll be your perception. But let's flip the script. Because the reality is, is that gratitude is not just a get better self-help thing. 
It's something that Scripture teaches us is a good, worshipful posture toward God. And God is worthy of praise no matter our circumstances. So this month, I want us to not only focus on how Paul shows gratitude in these passages, but I want us to focus on what he has gratitude for and why. Because the truth is, if we want to align ourselves with the Word of God and have a posture of gratitude, not like the world says, but like God teaches, we should open our eyes to the things that God counts as worthy of being grateful for. Because if we can do that, if we can do that, it will help us get through life when it's challenging, when it's hard, and when it feels like things are going wrong. So here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 4. I give thanks. By the way, I'm just going to pause there. I know I got three words in. I give thanks. It's the verb Eucharisto. If that sounds familiar, it's where we get our word Eucharist. So that's another name for communion which we take. So fun fact, communion is also a gratitude meal. That's why we do it every week. Anyway, uh, so I give thanks to who? To my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, these sections, uh, these thanksgiving sections in these letters were common practice in uh, the first century in letters that were being written. We call these epistles, that's the like technical term, but that basically means a letter. Uh, a lot of the books that we have in our New Testament are letters. They're letters written by individuals or groups of individuals uh, written to deal with particular situations or to communicate something uh, to the recipients. And oftentimes, the recipients of these letters, I shouldn't say oftentimes, all the time, the recipients are people that make up the churches in the region uh, that the text is named after. And so, when we think about Corinth, uh, the Corinthian church, these letters circulated within the Corinthian region. They wasn't just one big church at Corinth. There were several smaller churches. Some met in homes, some met in uh, public meeting spaces, uh, especially if some of the people within the church had, uh, were well-to-do. They might have been able to supply a public meeting space for these Christians to meet. And so, these letters would circulate. And so, what we're having here is we're getting to see, actually, I'll rephrase it this way. Have you ever been in the room with somebody that's on the phone? Maybe your spouse is on the phone. Maybe they, they're, they're calling a relative or something like that, or the relative called them. Here, we'll use this one. The relative called them. And you can hear your spouse's side of the conversation, but you can't hear the other side. And so, if you're really good at eavesdropping, you can listen in and maybe figure out what the issue of the day was that prompted the phone call just by hearing the responses your spouse is making, even if you don't know the real reason why the person called. And then the real fun game is, of course, when they get off the phone, oh, what was that about? And then, you know, your real interest is in whether or not you had figured it out or not. I'm just kidding. Your real interest is because you care and all this stuff. But, but basically, here, here's, here's, here's what these letters are. These letters are Paul's side of the phone call. We don't know the correspondence he received that prompted. We don't know the reports precisely. 
that he got about these churches in Corinth and the issues that they have. But we can do a good enough job digging when we read these passages and we see what he deals with and what he says to the churches to figure out what the problems were. And the funny thing is, is that in these moments of thanksgiving, which are in every letter in the first century, even non-Christians that wrote letters would probably have some sort of gratitude moment in them, it's very easy to skim over them because they're like, okay, Paul introduces himself in the first three verses, and then he says what he's thankful for. Now let's get to the meat of it. But the thing is, what he's thankful for in these letters sets up his addressing of the issues that the church are facing. Which is also interesting because that means he's thankful for something within the issues that he's having to deal with, which is not our common posture of gratitude. We want the sun shining, birds chirping, everybody having a good time in order to feel thankful. But everybody's not having a good time in Corinth. In Corinth, they're divided based off of leadership. Some people like this one leader, and other people in the Corinthian churches like another leader. It's just not all that different from our politics today. And so they're fighting with each other. You know, Jesus prayed for unity of the church in John 17. You should look it up and read it. And it's a big issue for the early church. It's a big issue today. And yet the church at Corinth is divided over this leadership power struggle. He's also aware that there are people that are continuing to live in sin and do so egregiously, almost as if they're proud of it. He knows that's what he's dealing with. But of course, as I'll show us at the end, we have good reason to understand why Paul would be grateful for a church even this off the path. So he says, I give thanks to my God always for you. Always. Always? Really? Even knowing what you know, Paul? Always? Do you always give thanks for the people in your life? What if they're, what if they're mean to you? Or they step out of line? Always? Anybody? Always? I can't even keep five every day. So I know none of us probably pass the always test. But Paul, always. Why? Well, he says always for you, but not because of you. (laughs) I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Grace. Do you know what grace means? It means unmerited favor. If you're not familiar with the word merit, uh, you probably are if you have a job. If you go to a job every day, you get paid for doing that job. You earn your money off of a merit system. But God's grace is unmerited, which means you can't earn it, but he gave it to you anyway. And he gave it to this church that is all over the place and messed up. And what is this grace of God that was given? Well, it was given in Christ Jesus, who died for our sins and was raised on the third day, conquering sin and death for all time. That grace was given, unmerited. And he goes on, he says that in every way you're enriched in him in all speech and knowledge. Now, speech and knowledge, this is something that if we're reading in translation, we can gloss over here. But the Greek words here, number one, speech is logos, which John uses to refer to Jesus as the word. It's this idea in the Greco-Roman world that a lot of pagan folks or people that did not come from Jewish background, which would have been the total of the Corinthian church, they would have prided themselves on being rich in speech and knowledge, special wisdom, being smarter than everybody else, being in a tap into the unknown of the world and reaching a higher plane of spirituality, knowledge, and existence. And Paul is doing something here. He is saying that he's grateful 
that God has enriched them in all speech and knowledge. So not the worldly stuff they were used to, but in a new one through Jesus that, again, is unmerited. They can't get for themselves. So they ain't better than anybody else. So he's already in his gratitude moment dealing with the issues he knows he's going to be dealing with later in the letter. Even as the testimony about Christ Jesus was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the big one. I've said this to people in individual conversation and in teaching moments all the time. The number one thing that the New Testament is interested in is in compelling Christian people to live out their faith daily until the moment that they die or the moment that Jesus returns. It's called perseverance. Paul is grateful that God can do something about the imperfections of the people of Corinth so that they are not lacking in any gift as they await the return of Jesus or the consummation of all things. He wants them to be able to go the distance of faith to the very end. And for that, he's grateful. And he says that Christ will sustain them until the end to make them guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he comes back, he will find them in good standing. And why is he so confident about this? Especially given that he's writing to a church that's a mess. He's confident not because of them. He's confident because God is faithful. By whom you were called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now again, throughout this, he mentions gifts. He's going to deal with spiritual gifts later in the letter. He also mentions fellowship here. Fellowship doesn't work too well when you're divided. He is, again, speaking gratitude into the problems of the church. And he's grateful for the people, not because of where they are, but because of the hope that he has and what God can transform them to become. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. And I'll tell you why. Because we are short-term gratitude thinkers. And what I mean by that is, you have a day. You decide whether or not the day was good or bad. And if the day was good, you're grateful. And if it wasn't so good, you want to go to sleep so that you can get another crack at it the next day. And hope that the day before doesn't carry over when you wake up the next morning. Otherwise, you're going to wake up the next morning and you're going to have a bad day again because you're going to imagine that the coffee grinds were in there, even if they weren't. But Paul has a long view, and we're not very good at this. Paul has a long view that is shared with the long view of God. And that is that Paul is capable of being grateful for a people group that he's writing to, not for who they are now, but for who they can become. And he trusts that God is faithful enough to get them there. And we're not good at this. We want people to be who we think they should be right now. And if they're not, we either try to force the issue and control it or cut them out. Cut them out. And either one of those solutions, by the way, it won't work. Do you want to know why? is you and I are not capable of changing anybody else. You think you're in control? You think you're in control of your kid, your spouse, your friends, your family, your coworkers? You're not. But God's in control. Of course, he doesn't control us. He invites us to walk in step with him. But only he can make the change. And here's the beauty of this story. Paul, I don't know if you know, if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard the story about Paul. He was a Pharisee by the name of Saul. And in the book of Acts, we have detailed the formation and foundation of the early church. The Christians 
the followers of Jesus, Peter, James, John, and the like, they're filled with the Spirit, and they go out, and they go to convert the masses. And along the way, they have a lot of success, and they baptize thousands. And people come to the faith, and everything's good. They have everything in common. They pray together. They listen to the apostles' teaching about Jesus. They give everything that they have to one another so that nobody's in need. It's all good. It's the kind of day that you want to be thankful for. And then all of a sudden it gets difficult. Some people in the church start to not play along with the way the church is supposed to function. And then they face some adversaries that don't like the spreading of this newfound faith in Jesus. And they start to make life difficult for the early Christians. And we get this story in Acts 7 and 8 that this guy named Stephen, who is an early deacon in the church, is filled with the Spirit and begins to teach, and he's falsely accused and brought in before the religious leaders. And he preaches a message to them. And while he's on fire, it doesn't go super well for him. Because when they don't like what they hear, it says that they begin to gnash their teeth at them. It's like they're closing their ears and say, la, 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 like that, because they don't want to hear it. And they drag him outside, and they stone him to death. Which means that they pick up rocks and continue to pelt him until he succumbs to the injuries. And we're told Saul, the Pharisee, who is our Paul that's writing this letter, stands there in oversight and approves of what they've done to Stephen. We're even told that before they get the stones out, they lay their outer garments at the feet of Saul. You know, so they don't have to break a sweat throwing the stones. It's his mark of approval that they laid them at his feet. Well, this Saul continues to go on, and he's ready to snuff out the church. And he gets paperwork that says he can go round up the Christians in the Damascus area and imprison them or get them to be quiet about Jesus. And when he's on the road, a great light blinds him. And he hears a voice. And the voice says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says that you will be my instrument to the Gentiles. And he also says, I will show you how much you have to suffer. And Saul, after a couple days, another Christian who didn't want to go see him because he heard about his background and was a little nervous, this, this Christian, Annas, goes and he prays with Saul and he baptizes him and the scales fall off of his eyes and he ends up realizing that this Jesus whom he was persecuting by persecuting the church showed him grace. He was an antagonistic against the gospel and God still loved him and saved him. And that zeal to hunt down the church became zeal to promote it to the ends of the earth. Unmerited grace is what Paul received. He would go on to call himself the chief of all sinners, the persecutor of the church. Paul's mentality was, if God can save me, he can save anybody. And so his hope, his hope, his reason for having gratitude for this messed up church in Corinth is not just rooted in a false belief of what God can do, but in the knowledge of what God can do because he did it for him. That's what the long game of gratitude looks like. It's being grateful for what you have in the moment, not because it's always going well, but because of what God can do with it. It's being grateful for the people in your lives, not because they always please you, but because what God can do in their lives over the long haul. We have no idea what God can do. 
I'll give you a little example of the way that this long-term thinking has, has, has helped me, and it's, again, another little anecdote. So many of you have known and have asked me over the last weeks about my wife's seizure that she had in August, and so she got put a, a lengthy driving restriction because neurologists don't want to risk getting in trouble. Anyway, uh, so it has made things challenging, like she can't always just go out where she wants to go, and well, my son even has preschool on a daily basis, and so I'm, I'm our lone driver right now. And I remember in the days after that, you know, after hearing that from the doctor, it was like, oh, I can't believe he slapped us with this long of a thing. But I've noticed something. Had that not happened, there are experiences that we've been able to have as a family together, even if they're just for a matter of minutes, that we would not have had together had the doctor not done that. And I will tell you confidently, because I am not a psychic or that kind of prophet, I did not know at the time that we were angry about the driving restriction that we would experience the good things that we've experienced in the moment. Because I don't know what God can do with any situation. I've gotten to pick up my son from school and hear in his car together what he did that day. Sometimes I might not want to hear it. <laughs> but other times, I cherish those moments because I wouldn't have heard them otherwise. We wouldn't have heard them together. You have no idea what God can do, even with a moment that seems to be going wrong. So many moments are teachable. So many moments that don't look good can end up being a blessing. And so mo many moments can actually be good if you're just willing to open your eyes and look. And if you do that, fine and five ain't that hard. <laughs> so I want to challenge you this week and throughout this series. Pick a number. It doesn't have to be five. That's what my counselor told me. But try to daily write down somewhere, one to ten, number in between, what you're grateful for. But also try to do it through God's lens and not just your own. Because you have no idea what God is doing behind the scenes that can come to fruition, even if things don't look all that great. I did not pick this series last year because of Thanksgiving. I'm just not that sentimental. Oh, you better believe I picked this series because of the election on Tuesday. Because I prayerfully was considering the fact that in the earliest church, division rather than fellowship, gratitude being left at the door for always recognizing what's wrong and what's going wrong is our normal posture of life. And we were called by Jesus to be his disciples, to be set apart and to be different from the world. So let's start on Sunday. I care about what's going to happen on Tuesday, but on another level, I kind of don't care. Because I care about what God wants us to be and what he wants to make us to become. So don't wait until you get the results to determine whether or not you're going to be grateful to God. Start now. Because I promise you, you have no idea what he can do. And if you don't believe me, just consider the fact that you're sitting here right now. Because I know what he did for me. Not just in this season of life, but that he saved me through his son, Jesus. And if you believe that, he saved you just like he did Paul. And you have reason to be thankful. Here's another reason to be thankful. Each week we take communion as a church family. And we do this because it is a gratitude meal. 
Jesus told his earliest disciples, do this in remembrance of me. And oftentimes, because of the nature of what these elements mean, that they point to his body, which was given, and his blood, which was poured out, we tend to take a somber tone with communion. But it is, in fact, a meal of thankfulness. Because we recognize that in the darkest hour, if you want to talk about God being able to do something with something that don't look so good, there's a funny reason we call it Good Friday, because there's nothing good about crucifixion. But oh boy, did God do something good on Good Friday. Because Jesus gave his life so that we could have life to the full. And when we take communion, we offer up thanksgiving to him for what he has done for us. So I'll give you a moment to reflect on what God has done for us through his son Jesus. And after that moment of reflection, we will take communion together as one church family. take and drink from this cup. This is his blood which is poured out for us. Please uh, pray with me. Dear Lord God, uh, we thank you for being good to us. We thank you for your unmerited grace through your son Jesus. We thank you that we have hope that supersedes what feels like the hardships and realities of this life. We have hope in you, not just for what you will do, but what you've already done. We know that you are trustworthy and true. And I just pray, God, that you help us in all moments and at all times to remain faithful to you uh, through thick and thin, through the hard times and the good ones. And Lord, I just pray right now uh, as we, as uh, American citizens we know that Tuesday is a presidential election it's the one time every four years that we all get anxious and nervous and wondering what the outcome is and what it's going to mean and, and, and God I, I pray that you will be with uh, us as a country and as people uh, in the outcome but God I'm going to pray more importantly that for those of us that call ourselves disciples of your son, Jesus, that you will help us to remain faithful, that you will help us to remain gracious, that you will help us to remain merciful, that you will help us to see others as your children and not as enemies, that you will help us to see other people as possibilities and not problems, and that you will help us to bring light and salt to them. Not so that they will pick our side of the political aisle, but God, I pray that they will come to worship you, the true king, as we strive to do so as well. Be with us and help us to be guided by your spirit and by your word alone and nothing else. And help us to remain faithful all of our days. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.